So uh, to begin, our objective for today's session is uh, to learn how to begin a new FileMaker project. Uh, we're going to go through a discussion of what data modeling is, learning how to identify entities and attributes, and how to tell the difference between entities and attributes. I'm just going to give you as many of the, the tips and tricks and strategies that I use in each of the projects that I have done and do. Then we're also going to learn how to draw an entity relationship diagram, which is like the blueprint that a database developer would take into a job in the same way that an architect would drop a blueprint that the construction team would then follow when they go to construct a building. We'll learn the purpose, as I just described, of an ERD. We'll see what they look like as we build one up. And we'll also talk about what tools you can use to, uh, to build an ERD. You don't need anything very fancy, but we'll give you some interesting options, hopefully, that you might use to, to build ERDs. All right, so the first step in data modeling is to identify the and attributes of the real world scenario. In identifying the entries, entities and attributes, what you're doing is you're going on a hunt for nouns. As you read through the, the description of what a database should do, um, what, its, what its users need, um, you're going to be looking for nouns, or if you're just talking about it, if you're in uh, you know, group discussions, or even if it, this is all just in your own head, as you plan a database that you need to build for yourself or your organization, listen for the nouns, because usually nouns equal entities, most of the time. Nouns are gonna equal your entities. And, and the entities are the things that we need to store information about. Now, to tell the difference between an entity and an attribute, simply ask yourself this question. If a noun that you're considering has multiple values that describe it, it's an entity. So the question is, what do I know about this thing that I'm considering uh, that describes it? If there's more than one value that describe it, then it's an entity. On the other hand, if a noun has only one value that describes it, like let's say we're thinking about price, right? The price of a product or a service. There's just one thing about that idea of price that we'd need to store and that is the, the number, the price, the dollar figure. And so price is not an entity, it's just an attribute of an entity. So that's the line of thinking that you need to follow. What describes this entity? If you're talking about the entity of person, Right? A person as an entity has lots of attributes that describe it. First name, last name, telephone number, and so on. And so obviously person is an entity. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Any confusion or questions? All right, fantastic. And I do want this to be interactive and engaging, but if you don't mind, go ahead and, and keeping your mics muted until you have question or feedback. That's fantastic. <clears throat> The reason we go on a hunt for the nouns and, um, and need to find the nouns is because, as I mentioned earlier, nouns usually indicate entities or attributes. And once you've discerned what entities you have in a particular scenario, those entities then are going to become the tables when you turn to FileMaker and start building. The entities become tables and the attributes become fields, okay? fields within the tables. All right, let's do a little practice scenario. Ready? <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> Got to get good at this. Let's say we run an animal care clinic and we need a database to manage the daily operations. This animal care clinic needs to track customers by household and the animals they bring for care. Appointment details like date, time, animal, veterinarian, room, services and medical supplies that the veterinarian provides so that they can charge properly for the services provided and manage inventory as well. And then lastly, payments received from their clients per visit. So I'm gonna open it up and we're gonna see how we do at identifying all of the potential entities, okay? Let's, can you still read the text here okay if I shrink it down to that size? Yes. Yep. Okay, fantastic. So I've got another PowerPoint document open over here that's ready for our, uh, our efforts here. So what potential nouns or what nouns do you see in the description 
that uh, might be potential entities. And I'll just jot them down as you blurt them out. Let's pick off the easy ones first. Customer. Customer, good. Animals. Animal, good. Eight and Veterinarian. Time. Veterinarian, good. Room. Veterin, oh, that's a tough one. Veterinarian. Okay, I heard someone say date and time. Now let's talk about date and time. What is there about a date? So we're trying to figure out if something is an entity or an attribute, right? And, and I taught you that you'll want to ask yourself, uh, are there multiple attributes about this thing that we're considering? Or is there just one attribute, one value? So uh, let's take the date of, a, of an appointment. Is how many how many different pieces of information are there about a date? One so there, or many? So there, so there could be many dates per the one customer. If we're talking about a date, yes. How many uh, how many pieces of information are there that describe that date that we would need? Three, three. <laughs> you really want to split out months and days and years? You want to have a month table, a day table, and a year table, folks? Come on, let's be realistic. It's a date, right? It's only appointment one. date. It's a date. Oh, good. Someone said appointment date. So that's, date? that's telling us that the date describes what? The, uh, the appointment. The, the appointment. So is date an attribute or is it an entity? Attribute. It's an attribute of appointment. Outstanding. That's the process that we go mm -hmm. through every time we uh, mm -hmm. approach some, some potential entity. Uh, as we're looking at that noun of date and a date or time, we ask ourselves those questions. How, how many pieces of information are there about it that describe it? And there's, for a date, just like a price, the example I gave in the slide earlier, mm -hmm. there's just one piece of information. So that's an attribute. And then the job, of course, is to figure out, well, which entity does it describe? But you already did that. It describes mm -hmm. an appointment. So let me add appointment, or actually I'm gonna change it to visit going to use the word visit rather than appointment because I just think it describes it a little bit better. An appointment, you know, you could cancel an appointment, but a visit is something that already took place or that that uh, is for certain. Service. Okay, good. What else? Room. Service. Room. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear the other one. What? Service. Service. Excellent. As in, what kind of work was performed on that poor animal? I love it. All right, what else? What about supplies? supplies? Supplies, good. And if I didn't hear you, just say it again. Sorry, I'm, we've got, you know. Uh, payment. Payment. Ah, okay. Let's talk about payment. How many pieces of information are there that describe a payment? One. It's like price. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps just one. Unless maybe we need to keep track of when that payment was made and in what form it came. Was it a credit card swipe, a check, was it cash? Then all of a sudden there, there are multiple pieces of information about that idea of payment. The other thing that you need to consider as well is whether there's a, um, a what we call a one to many relationship between the thing that you're considering and some other thing in the system. For example, let's say that um, when a customer comes in for a visit, that you will allow them to make multiple payments to pay off that visit. You'll allow them to pay installments, if you will. All of a sudden now, that becomes a, a one-to-many relationship between the visit and the appointment, and therefore, the, uh, sorry, the visit and the payment, and therefore we need a table to keep track of payments because there could be more than one of them per appointment. So that's another little bit of um, criteria that you need to be running through your head as you consider these entities and attributes. Um, if there's a potential one-to-many relationship between some, right, the, in this case, the visit that the customer would be paying for and their payment by their invoice does that make sense any questions or confusion on that
Okay, fantastic. Well, you're doing great. This is fantastic. Um, what else do we have? Invoice. Okay, an invoice. So are we going to invoice more than once for each visit? Probably not. And so uh, of, uh, if there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the visit that's being invoiced and the invoice itself, one-to-one -one relationships are pretty rare. And maybe they're pretty rare because they're oftentimes unnecessary. So we may not need an invoice entity if we're only invoicing once per visit, the visit table or the visit entity could encompass what we need, okay? Because for a visit, we'll be keeping track of what services were performed during that visit. And those services will each have a price uh, assigned to them, okay? And so we could have our, our line items that way, if you will, on the invoice. Now, I just gave you a hint to another table that, or another entity that's kind of missing. Is that line items? Yeah, the line items for the services provided during a visit. The services provided during a visit. This service entity, we could probably think of it as the, the overall catalog of what we provide, right? We'll do this and that, we'll splint a broken leg and we'll, um, we'll uh, administer drops of you know, this or that into the, the animal's eyes or, or what have you. So if this service entity is just kind of the catalog of everything that we can perform, that we can do, all the different surgeries and so forth, then um, we would need some place to keep track of for any given visit, what services were provided for that one visit. And so a lot of times you, you think of that as a kind of a line item type of a table, but let's say that um, we'll just call it services provided or something like that. Right. <clears throat> what about this whole notion of inventory? Anything, uh, anything in there? That's supplies, isn't it? Good. Supplies is what we've got on hand, but where do we get them? Who do we buy from? So well, vendor? You need a vendor thing? Vendor, maybe a vendor table. Sure, a vendor entity. Absolutely. And then what do we place with those vendors? We place orders or purchases, right? Let's, let's use purchases instead. Like that. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And then because a purchase, like an invoice, can have line items on it, we'll probably need some kind of a purchase line entity as well, where we can store the, the uh, individual line items, one line item in each record on a given purchase. Wouldn't we need to track inventory? Well, we've got a supply table here, which is where I was imagining we would keep track of quantity on hand, right? For medicines and uh, uh, gauze and all the things that we use in our practice. So there could be calculations written in there that would keep track of, uh, or that would automate the uh, calculation of uh, items used, which would be listed here and items purchased, which would be listed here. So you get that constant ebb and flow of items in, uh, on, on hand or quantity in stock for each, for each item. Tim? Yeah. How, how, how would interfacing with future appointments fall into that potential entities? In other words, if there was follow-up needed, how would that, where would that be? Because it's a date, it's a customer, it's driven by usually a length of time. Good. Well, a follow-up visit would, of course, just be another visit, right? But we would want to make a note somewhere for ourselves 
as to when that follow-up visit should probably occur. Right. And what does that describe? What um, what is what does that what, uh, where does that belong? Right. If after customer so and so brings animal such and such in for a visit, mm. and we want to see that animal again in two weeks, that would be an appointment. Seems to me like it describes. Which the is, uh, the visit, right? The visit. From the date of this visit, add two weeks, and then we've got a follow-up visit okay. or uh, the desire for a follow-up visit. That visit hasn't happened yet, nor has it even been scheduled yet, but the, um, the uh, scheduling clerk at the clinic could probably do a routine search on that visit table and see, hey, are there any visits where we wanted follow-up visits this week? And we could then call the customer and say, would you like to schedule that follow-up visit that your veterinarian recommended? Any other thoughts on how to handle that? Okay, fantastic. Well, this is great, you've all done really well. So then the process, once you've identified as many, as many entities as you can, and you've sifted through or weeded out the, uh, the potential uh, ones that you know, are just off the mark or maybe are redundant, because in our language, we have lots of duplicate words, words that, that could describe the same thing. Um, once you've narrowed down those synonyms to just one per real entity, then you start building up your entity relationship diagram. And um, you can use all sorts of tools for that. In fact, let me jump over back into slideshow view. And the purpose of building an entity relationship diagram is to force you and I to figure out what tables and fields and relationships we need in a given system, right? Figure out what those most fundamental building blocks of the database need, uh, need to be there. Now, here are some of the tools that you can use to build your entity relationship diagram. Uh, first, the digital tools. Uh, you can use a drawing software application like Visio on the PC or OmniGraffle on the Mac, or there are many other drawing tools available. I just did a, a quick uh, search on the Mac App Store yesterday, and there were probably a half a dozen different drawing programs that could be had for less than $25. You could use a slide program like PowerPoint or Keynote or Google Slides. I mean, everybody has free access to Google Slides, and essentially all you really need to build an entity relationship diagram is any software that provides you with a blank canvas, you know, kind of a working space, and a text tool so that you can type onto that canvas and line drawing tools so that you can draw onto that canvas. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of using just PowerPoint or Keynote or Google Slides. They work great. Now for analog tools, if you'd rather not use software, I, I prefer software because it's so much more editable. You can make changes, move things around, rearrange, Re rewrite, revise without having to, to use up your pencil eraser. But uh, analog tools, good old pencil and paper is fine. Or a whiteboard. I can't tell you how many times I've drawn out ERDs on whiteboards and then taken a phone picture of them so that I have, have it uh, permanently before the whiteboard gets erased. Or sticky notes on a, you know, on a paper or cardboard backing like this. This, uh, this little diagram here or this little photograph, I should say, works great. You can literally use sticky notes, uh, and they're great because you can rearrange them, move them around. Oh, go ahead and mute yourself if you don't mind, please, if you're, uh, if you're not uh, talking right now. And so you can use sticky notes because you can easily move them around on the backing. And then once you've got them positioned in such a way where the lines won't crisscross so much, then you can draw in the lines. Um, always use pencil when you're drawing lines in because we'll all make mistakes. All right, so those are some of the tools that you can use in building your ERD. So I'm gonna bail back out of the slideshow once again. And here I am in a PowerPoint slide that's got a blank canvas and a text tool and a 
and a drawing tools. And so what I've done is just set up kind of a, a sample entity. I'm just going to option drag it or make a drag copy. That'd be control drag on a PC and start building up your ERD. You take the first, uh, the first potential entity and you think, yeah, a customer is definitely an entity that we'd need in this system. We'll put it at the top of the box. We know that we're going to need to give every entity a primary key value, some unique identifier. And so just out of hand, we're going to use an ID field. And then we can go on and list any other attributes that we'd want to keep track of about your customers. So things like yeah, uh, first name, last name, and so forth, right? How many times have we done this? Okay, now there is uh, an argument to be made for um, adding as many of the attributes as you can think of here on your ERD because it, again, forces you to go through the hard thinking, forces you to go through the thoughts. Um, but in terms of space, as you saw on my, uh, my sticky note example, sometimes it's good enough just to list the entity name and maybe the primary and foreign key attributes. So the ID of that, ta or that entity and then the IDs of any other entities where this entity is gonna be on the many side of a one-to-many relationship. And then we just do it again. So we'll option drag my little entity box out here, the next entity, animal, and so forth, and continue on in like manner, right? So an animal is gonna uh, have attributes like, well, the name of the animal, but more importantly, since let's talk about the, you know, the relationship aspects of it, how do we know whose animal this is? How are we going to note to whom this animal belongs? With a foreign key that links to the customer ID. Okay, good. We could use customer ID. Now, as I was working through this in advance, um, I, I came to the realization that um, there could be a you know, that the animal oftentimes belongs to a whole household of people. And it may be uh, one person in that household who brings in the animal one day and another person who brings it in another day. And that's a different customer, right? They're family members, but they could take turns bringing the animal in. How are we going to handle that? I think you're, what you're talking about is maybe a join table. Maybe. What could I would can go could ahead. be an attribute under customer. It would list who who the family members are, wouldn't it? Well, a customer is one person. You could have so, a household about a entity. Family ID. There we go. Let's add another entity. Household or family, right? Let's add an entity called household, and then we will for each customer note what household that customer lives in. So then you get this, this kind of parent, this super group called household. And within that household, you'll have customers who live in that household because they all share the same household ID number. Does that make sense? Uh, actually, let me just move this one over. And this is why I like software tools because you can do things like that, move them around so much more easily. Uh, let's put household here. Okay. And so for each household, we'll give them an ID number and we'll give them an overall name, you know, the, uh, the Johnson family or something like that. You have to be careful with those because you're, you're going to want them to be unique. And then over here in customer, somebody said it, but uh, I'd love to hear it again. How do we, how do we handle this? What are we going to do? Household ID. There you go. We're going to put what's called a foreign key field in the customer entity that will allow us to denote which household that customer lives in or belongs to. Excellent. And now for the animal. Now we come instead of customer ID, the animal belongs to the whole house, right? Yep. Are you using ancestors? I know there's some animals where you might think, oh, it's definitely his or it's definitely hers or, but for our purposes, the animal belongs to a given household. And of course the animal will have a name and so forth. 
All right. So that's the general idea of using a software tool like PowerPoint to create an ERD. And what I do is as I handle each entity, I either scratch it off, delete it from the potential list, or just put a strike through through it so I know I've, when I've taken care of them all. Any questions or uh, confusion or concerns about that building process? All right, fantastic. And let me race back through that. And so now we come to the aspect of building the ERD where we need to figure out what kind of relationships exist between different entities in our entity relationship diagram because part of the purpose of building the ERD is to forces to identify the entities that we need and another part of it is to figure out or to force us to figure out what relationships exist between those entities so we're going to do a little practice determining cardinality and the key to practicing cardinality or sorry to determining cardinality is you ask yourself this question for any one of these how many of those could relate and vice versa so for this first example for any one customer how many orders could relate, one or many? So it's a one to many. All right, and you figured that out by saying for any one customer, okay. there could they be could, many orders. what's that? There could be many orders. Yeah, they could over time place many orders, good. So I'll draw in a many on this side, indicated by the crow's feet. Sorry, I'm not a good artist. And then likewise, you have to ask it from both directions. For any one order, how many customers could relate how many customers placed that one order and then there's just one. one customer bill to up at the top of that order so it's one how about aquarium and fish for any one Wait. aquarium there could be many fish many fish good all right but for any one fish there could be there many being one it can only be in one aquarium at a time. It, yeah. it can only be in one aquarium at a time. Exactly right. So then, of course, we need to ask ourselves, do we care about the history of that fish? And do we need to keep track of w which aquariums it lived in at any given, you know, over its life? And if the answer is no, we just care about uh, where it is now, then it's a simple one to many. But if we needed to keep that history, then it would be a many to many because that fish may have lived in many aquariums over its life. You see? Okay, next one. Actors and movies. Those of you who have taken our classes here are familiar with this one. And again, let me emphasize the key. Make sure that you are using this phrase right here when you calculate the cardinality or the nature of a relationship because it's too easy to get yourself thinking in the abstract but it's always determined from the scope of a single record or a single instance of one of these guys and a single instance of one of those. So for any one actor, that actor could have played in many movies. Many, many, many movies. movies, good, exactly. Movies. And for any one movie, that movie could feature how many actors? Many. many, many actors. Very good, so we've got a many to many relationship here, which we'll talk about in a moment. Next one, students and classes. What do you think? Many, many to many. Many, many, many to many. many. Good. So for any one student, they could attend many classes over the course of their career as students. And for any one class, that class might have many students in it, right? The uh, Tuesday, Thursday at 9.45 a.m. English 101 class could have lots of students in it. Wonderful. Good job. And artists and paintings. This is kind of those, well, it depends, isn't it? Yeah. For any one artist, of course, they could have many cre paintings. created many paintings. Good, all right. But for any one painting, how many artists could have been involved? Usually well, one. Usually one, right. But there may be some cases like a big uh, urban mural or something like that where there were a whole bunch of artists involved. And so 
that's the kind of question you need to go back to the client for whom you're building this database and say, hey, how does this work for you all? And if they say, well, eh, sometimes we have multiple artists on a painting, but you know, not, not often. Well, if they even say that it could, it could occur once where there's many of these involved with, with one of these, then you need to de declare that it's a many-to-many -many relationship. Because if you don't, then the users won't have a way to enter the data that they need to enter. If they say, oh no, 100% of the time and without fail and for on and on forevermore into the future, it will only be one, then you could leave it as a one to, a one to many. That'd be fine. Good? Good. Okay, so I mentioned that we would talk about many to many relationships next. So let's do that. Many to many relationships <laughs> are bad. Do not leave them in, okay? Do not leave many to many relationships in your solution. They result in um, the inability to enter certain kinds of data, the inability to create certain kinds of reports, and we need to, uh, we need to fix or solve that problem. And you solve many to many relationships, you resolve that problem by adding a table between them. One of the gentlemen said a join table, and that's exactly right. We use a join table, or I should say, the table that we stick in between two tables that have a many-to-many -many between them, it, we often give it the name join table, but that's not to uh, disqualify it or make it any less of a normal table. In fact, those middle tables oftentimes are the real workhorses of the system. But we call it a join table because it's allowing us to join or to resolve the problem between those two entities between which we had a many-to-many -many relationship. And adding the join table divides that many-to-many -many relationship into two healthy, I'll say, one-to-many relationships. Finding a name for that uh, join table can be the most difficult part about it. <laughs> uh, so when in doubt, just you know, stick the two names of the outer tables together, like actor movie or uh, fish aquarium or something like that. Uh, for the name of that middle table if there's not a better word in our language for that concept. So I went ahead and, and built up the animal care clinic ERD um, as far as I could see it at least and these are the entities that I came up with. We got a lot of them, didn't we? We didn't talk about animal type or species, but that might be a good thing to have so that you could classify each animal as being a dog or cat or snake or something like that. But uh, we handled uh, almost all of these. So well done. Dose I think was also missing, um, but that might've been what we called um, treatment provided. And then the relationship lines would look something like that. Since PowerPoint doesn't have the little three-fingered crow's feet, I just use the arrow on the many end of the relationship lines to denote that that's the many side of that one-to-many relationship. <clears throat> so you can see why uh, some kind of software is oftentimes helpful to do these because I moved these around for an awful long time in order to get them to look reasonable and where the lines weren't crisscrossing all over the place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, no, I don't want to keep the ink annotations. That is kind of what I wanted to, uh, to get through in terms of my portion. Oh my heavens, it's 12.50. All right, so let's open it up and hear your questions. 